I remember I had a watch. I remember I... I cracked the glass on my watch. And I kept thinking I was playing with time. And I would say, it's not five o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna make it two o'clock in the afternoon. Thinking, I'm, I'm not part of the normal world. I'm separating myself off from the normal world. I'm making my own reality. The actor David Harewood is probably best known for his roles in the big budget TV shows like Homeland, Supergirl and The Night Manager, but we all have our demons. Homeland star revealed last year that he suffered a mental breakdown at the beginning of his career. I am very, very open about it, but of course I hadn't realised I hadn't gone public. I don't always I remember that I'm supposed to be famous or well-known, so I just tweet things out. I've got 25,000 retweets. <laughs> and I, suddenly, I did have a bit of a panic, because I suddenly thought, oops, oops, <laughs> what am I admitting? Yeah. So it's World Mental Health Day today, so as someone who's had a breakdown and was sectioned in my 20s, I'm here to tell you that there's no shame in talking about it if you're struggling. I haven't done too bad since. Go easy on yourself today and get some help if you can. 30 years ago, I'd had a period of psychosis and I lost my mind. It's a period that is kind of scary because I don't remember huge chunks. I've always wondered what happened to me. I'm not bouncing off the walls and perfectly stable and married, two beautiful kids, very, very happy, successful. But I was sectioned. You know, I was in a mental institution, locked away. I'm wondering what the hell was it all about? Maybe I'll find some answers. When we talk about psychosis, there's still that stigma. Even I say I had a breakdown. Somebody was to say somebody's psychotic, you would instantly think that they're crazy, dangerous, a mad, sort of raving, loony. You know, that's what we think when we talk about psychosis. I remember going for long walks and I remember waking up or coming to, becoming lucid, walking down Tottenham Court Road, and I'd be like, what am I doing here? I'm sure I was at home 10 minutes ago. I better go home. And I'd start walking home I'd sort of black out, and next thing I know, it would be two o'clock in the morning, and I'd be walking through Camden. I had so much energy. I'd be buzzing out of my mind. Everything became kind of visceral, and just seeing the sunrise was like, wow, look at the sun come up, and I'm at the start of everyone's day. So I was kind of almost saying hello to everybody in the morning. I'd be like, morning, morning, what a great day. So it all just became like, I can do anything. I can be anybody, do anything. People say, oh, you know, crazy people hear voices. I heard voices. And it was clear as a bell in my head. Next thing I remember was waking up on a locked ward, surrounded by psychiatric patients. And I was really confused as to why I was there. I do remember moments, but at no point in the last 30 years has anybody really told me or explained to me what had happened. Hello. I'm David Harewood. I'm here to collect some uh, records. Thank you. I think it's pretty thick. There's quite a lot in here. I think it's really important for me to find out what happened and why it happened. 
there is a very important part of my life that I really haven't been able to explain. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hello, I'm Rowena. Nice Hi. to see you, David. Hi. Very nice to meet you. Yes, Dr. Course. Rowena Jones is part of a team of psychiatrists at Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Hospital. She's dealt with patients with psychosis for the last decade. I'm hoping she'll start helping me put the pieces together. Psychotic symptoms are when people have experiences that aren't based on reality. Um, so commonly people will have, say, hallucinations where they see or hear or feel things that aren't actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, or delusional beliefs, which are beliefs that develop without um, fact behind them. It would be really nice to sit down and talk to you about what I experienced and maybe you could explain to me what it was about. It sounds fairly grandiose um, really? as, a, as a set of delusions. There's things here about you talking for hours about a friend would buy you a wine bar, which would be like the Garden of Eden, wow. where you could pluck a guitar out of the grass. See, there was something really extraordinary going on in my head. Mm. And I was a great lover of literature. So I think, and as, as an actor, yeah. a lot of that was coming out in my sort of delusion, I think. The form of a, you know, of a psychiatric symptom is fairly constant, but the content very much people bring to it themselves. Right. So they have changed over the years. Religious delusions used to be a lot more common when we were, before we became such a secular society. So. Mm. Um, oh, now, so people would people yeah, so, were more like oh, it's, mm, it's, it's the mm. gods, it's the gods. Today, you meet people who've got delusions about social media. This is the time when you're actually in the hospital and very unwell. So suspicious and frightened and shouting. I've got to save the boy. So that's somebody who you felt life was in your hands. I, I mean, I don't understand that. I don't know who that boy refers to. It, it might be. Me. This was my local park. This was, this was it. This was this was where we used to play from when I was about um, six. First generation West Indian family. Probably the only black family on our end of the street. We used to ride my first chopper. Chop a bike around here, so um, climb these trees. Life was fun, life was um, simple. I was never the brightest kid in the class, I was never the most handsome, so I, I, I guess in order to kind of for me to stand out, I just became the clown, I just became the guy who was funny and loved it. At the end of secondary school, auditioned for drama schools and got into RADA. And, you know, you were doing elocution lessons, but suddenly you were being taught to say bath and not bath. I remember my mum looking at me and going, what's going on there, you know? What's happening to my son? He's changing. And I was, you know, I went there with a, probably a very thick Birmingham accent, talking like that, you know. And suddenly I was talking like that and, you know, being very, very posh. In those final days at drama school, the real world started to creep in. My agent would put me up for jobs and I was always working. But I didn't feel I was in control of it. I didn't feel like I was in control of my life. I'm supposed to be young and having the time of my life as a young actor. And the reality was, I was away from all my mates, I was totally alone, and I was really unhappy. And that's not really the time to start <laughs> smoking weed and drinking, but I, that's exactly what I did. And um, that's when the breakdown started to become something completely different. Everyone's psychosis is different, is unique to each individual, um, but actually there's a lot of shared experiences. And the three main symptoms are delusions, believing things that aren't real, like 
you're a messiah and that you can control the weather. Um, also hallucinations, that's hearing or seeing things that aren't there. And thought disorder, so that is where thoughts feel jumbled, with difficulty concentrating and communicating. Hello. I'm David Harewood. I'm looking to speak to Dr. Erin Turner. Yes, Ron, and I will give you a reason. Thanks very much. Hello. Hello, David. Oh, yeah. I'm good. How are you? I'm really, really well. Nice good. to see you. Good, and you? Shall we, yeah. shall we go outside then? Yeah, let's go. Brilliant. I'm a little wonder. Erin works with young people who've experienced psychosis, so I'm hoping she might be able to shed some light on why it might have happened to me. Psychosis never just happens out of the blue. You don't wake up one day and suddenly you've got psychosis. It, it generally builds up. So there may be some anxiety, some sleep disturbance, and then the stress levels reaches that tipping point, and that's when psychotic symptoms begin. And I think it's really helpful to consider it with the stress vulnerability model. This shows us that we're all on somewhere mm -hmm. the spectrum of vulnerability to develop psychosis. But if you've got high vulnerability, it doesn't take much stress to tip you over into psychosis. So the things that would move you from a low to a high vulnerability would be if you've had significant trauma in your life, a strong family history of psychosis, mm -hmm. um, if you're smoking a lot of cannabis, people who live in the city, um, high-pressured environments, mm -hmm. um, second-generation migrants. There's a lot of different things that make, can predispose you to psychosis. At the time it happened to me, huge stresses. So what were all those stressors then? Being away from home, yeah. moving every week, yeah. being reviewed, people talking about me. Now I did smoke cannabis, so I, I guess that edges up. But as I speak to you now, it was the stresses yeah. that were getting piling yeah. up and piling up. And because of my professional, you just get on with it. I do remember going to an audition. And the audition was on Windmill Street, and I know where Windmill Street is in Soho. And but I couldn't find it. I could not find Windmill Street. And I was walking around for hours. I don't remember what happened, but um, eventually I found Windmill Street. But I was about three hours late. And the casting director, she could tell I wasn't right. So the casting agent was this lady called Janie Fothergill. And I, I always remember the name. And I always remember she was very posh, but really sweet. Hello? Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, gorgeous. How are you? Very well. How are you? I'm really, really well. How's that? Is that like 25 years? Is it really that long? <laughs> Janie. Do you remember when I turned up late for the audition? Yes, I do. I'm pretty agitated and sort of pacing around a bit. I remember you saying, um, yeah, you know, I mean, really good. I mean, I'm really well, really well. But, um, you know, difficult when you're an alien. Wow. Wow. And I'm disappearing completely. Somehow, I must think it was a number for you to ring someone. A young guy that had been at Raj with you. I had these two very, very good friends that I used to live with um, when I was at drama school, and uh, Nick and Jez. <laughs> we, we, we all like to drink a lot. <laughs> We'd get stoned. We'd get stoned every night and laugh. Just laugh into the wee small hours, crash out, get up, and then go and study Shakespeare all day. We were nearly always together. Hello? <laughs> Hello, mate. Hello. And actually, you probably haven't spoken to them for a long time. Could you meet me at the Marlborough? The Marlborough? Yeah, 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 no worries. Brilliant, brilliant. Lovely. There's things I... that I want to make sure I cover. I'm hoping that they will be able to help me fill in some of the behaviours, perhaps be able to explain what, 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 how I was, how I was acting, how I was, how I was. <laughs> I wasn't sleeping, I was up all night. 
overthinking things. Are you right, mate? <laughs> I get these weird memories, and I don't know whether I'm making them up. So, when did you first hear there was things going wrong then? The audition was, to me, is the day that it all went horribly wrong. I we were out it. looking for you, and then we went to the house. Looking for me? I think so. We discovered you sitting. Mm. There were all these scruples cards all over the floor. There's a copy of Shakespeare <laughs> with a corkscrew screwed right through it. The thing I remember is being helpless. And I know I remember there being quite a long period of time, you know, maybe a week or five days of us coming back to see you yeah. and you not being right. You guys took me to the doctors, didn't you? We went yeah. to see a doctor. He said you, you had a mania. You had a mild mania, is how he described it. They sent us away with a few tablets. Fucking hell. Yeah, but this wasn't the, the big... No, big this no, wasn't the big... No, this was the leader. Course. And I remember taking you back to that flat and both of us, it had been such an effort to get you there. And they, they give you these tablets. And I remember saying to him, oh, this is just ridiculous. Don't and, take them. Yeah, I think we all did. I we mean, did. That was we, stupid, I, I wasn't remember it? that. I do remember that. I feel that makes me feel bad. No. We, uh, but you know but what I, I mean? We did yeah. say, oh, this is ridiculous. Just chuck them down in the. And you, we took them down the toilet. We took them down the toilet. And I want, sometimes I wonder what would happen if you'd have taken mm, those. Me too, actually. Yeah. I kept convincing them that I was okay because the energy was really exciting. Maybe if I'd have taken those tablets, all that energy would have gone away. And I didn't want it to end. Looking back on it, I was just so young and naive. I mean, I was in my early 20s. I guess I just didn't really have the language or the insight to actually understand what was happening to me. If you have a vulnerability to develop psychosis, late adolescence is really when it will emerge. There's a lot of stressors and there's a lot of biological and psychological changes that are taking place. So it becomes quite a fertile field for development of psychosis. And if young people start using strong cannabis at a very early age, their risk of developing psychosis is so much greater. <laughs> Erin's invited me to a drop-in clinic she runs as part of a service called Early Intervention, which is just for young people who've experienced psychosis. Hello. Hello. Hello David. Right. Come on in, Will. Excited Welcome to this. the drop-in, and we're very excited to have you. Thank you very much. I've never met anyone who's had psychosis before, so I want to see if there are any similarities in our experiences. Guys, this is David. Hello, Hello, Ian. Just... How are you doing? Right, nice to see you. I'm the Bromie. Nice to meet you, David. Hey, man, how are you? Conrad, nice to Conrad, meet you. Conrad, nice to meet you. How old are you? Uh, 20. 20? Yeah. Okay. Callum, 24. Callum, do it, mate. nice to meet you, man. Good to see you. I really appreciate you guys doing this. Tell me a little bit about your experience of psychosis. Basically, I started hearing voices when I was about 13, 14, and then I was like, socially smoking cannabis, as many young kids do. Mm started hearing voices and then it started come to a build-up around last year i was about 19 i just got through a lot of stress and that and that's when i realized i was i was losing it so mm. that's when i thought i need help right so when the voices started taking over so, yeah. can you remember a, a moment when something began to unravel yeah i mean the first ever time it was like an alligator at a, a watering hole it sort of just drags you in you know right, right. I just, I just lost touch with reality. Do you know, like, in a computer game, you might get, you know, your main character and, you know, your, your, your story art characters, but then everybody else is just a NPC, like a non-playable character, you know, and you, you do, everyone else is just drones, mm. but you, you, you're, it's, this is your world, Absolutely. this is... And you can understand mm. that. What's really encouraging for you, for you guys is that, you know, you've got a very good handle on it, and that's, mm. that's really encouraging for me to see. Yeah. yeah, I'd say early intervention has helped yeah. a lot with that, because, I mean, normally if you went, went, wanted to see a doctor, you'd wait weeks or you'd wait, you know, just however long, and you can't do that if you're mentally, you know, unstable. Whereas with early intervention, you see doctors once a week if you need to, and or changing meds if you need to. Well, you wouldn't get that back in your day. Do you no. know what I mean? You would not have that. No. And that's what... That support. That, is, that, that yeah. support is what has made probably a lot of us still alive right now. It was just 
brilliant to be able to just be with them, you know, and sit with them and talk to them. And then I spoke to Callum off camera, and he was—he's got a—he's got a business degree. He ain't no slouch. He spoke about things that I—I I understand. That sense of feeling that you're in a god, that sense of feeling that you are like in a computer game. I understood aspects of that. I remember one night. I sat in front of the mirror, convinced that my reflection was going to move and go, you got me. Let's swap sides. I was convinced of it. I was staring at myself like this. I know, I know, I know I'm going to outstare you. And I know at some point you're going to own up that you're really me and I'm really you, and we're going to swap sides. And actually, I'm going to cross into your reality, and you're going to cross into my reality. I was convinced of it. And I felt that, um, that um, I wasn't me. I felt that I was not real. When someone is experiencing a psychotic episode, there are very real biological processes going on in the brain. They may produce an excess amount of certain chemicals, one of which is called dopamine. Now, dopamine occurs naturally. It is used to help nerve cells communicate with each other. But if there is an excess of dopamine in the brain, it can play a part in the development of delusions and hallucinations. Psychosis can be really difficult to articulate, and so I would encourage my group to use whatever means that they can to help communicate, such as writing or drawing. Hello, mate. David, how are we doing? Sometimes there is so much that is going on in our unconscious that we can access through words. This is very nice, pal. Thank you very much. What's all this on the wall? What's all this? That's a constant reminder of who I am. If I'm in a sort of dissociated state, the way that I sort of I, I react to it, I was, I'll draw and I'll write how I'm thinking, what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. So when I'm grounded in a reality, I can look back and think what I'm think, what was I thinking, and try to understand sort of where my mindset is at, so I can sort of try and help myself to get better, if that makes sense. Yeah. What's this going to be relaxed? When I when I first started having psychosis before I started the antipsychotic medication. I had a lot of visual hallucinations and I saw him numerous times. It was always from a distance, you know, mm. but it was very, very scary. I mean, I was looking out the window and he was in the garden. Wow. Just standing there with the, with the ax and you run down and says, you go outside and he's gone. And you're thinking, was it real or was it? And you, you do honestly think that you are crazy. Mm. But then there'll be other stuff like this where I'll be suicidal and I'll go off on some sort of it's articulate it's, rant, it's interesting here because, because the stuff outside is in black and white. Yeah. And the stuff inside the noose is in colour. Yeah. It's almost as if... That's, that's the better way. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any outlets or anything when you were... I mean, I drew something. I mean, I drew this. I mean, mine's different. Mine, mine, I mean, mine's completely different. I mean, it's not anything that's as elaborate. I mean, I don't know why. That is I drew very it. interesting. I don't actually. know why I drew it. You know, the glasses. This was before I even wore glasses. There was something coming out of the top of my head. Something coming out of the top of my finger. It was a real sort of an arrival of this character. I felt like there was something coming out of me, shooting that out. Shows, of me. That shows. That shows you that you were. In a sense, Superman. That's that's actually. Uh, well, that's again. That's that's that, show, that's to give me a new perspective on you a little bit. Just that you're more like me than I thought. Although Callum has to live with his episodes almost every day, I do see a lot of similarities between him and me. I mean, while I didn't have any visual hallucinations, I do remember the first time I heard voices. I was completely on my own, and I was lying in bed. 
I literally, all I heard, it was as if it was like a, wake up. And I went, I just sat up like this. I was like, what the fuck is that? And it was, I, I went, I was literally like that. He said, don't panic. I'm Martin Luther King. He said, I'm Martin Luther King. And um, remember I did that speech, I have a dream. I was like, yeah. He says, well, when I was killed, the whole of reality became my dream. And tonight, various people around the world are going to sacrifice themselves and become angels. It's going to end violence and end world hunger and all that. It, it was like this huge fucking thing. And I was, I was in my bedroom crying my eyes out because I thought, this is going to happen. Me? You know, I'm part of this worldwide efforts to end, to end poverty and, you know, violence and, you know, he said, oh, yes, yes. He said, I want you to walk to Camden right now. And part of this mission was I was going to go to this, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, I was going to go to this shop, walk in. He said, don't be surprised if the shop is open, even though it's three o'clock in the morning. Go to the back of the store, there's going to be a suit hanging up. You're going to put the suit on, you're going to turn around. And when you turn around, that is the moment when life is going to change for millions of people. Obviously, the fucking shop's closed. I get there, and I'm trying to try the door. And I said, look, this isn't really working. And then this voice was going, OK, um, something's wrong. Something's wrong. You have to go home right now, because this isn't, this isn't working. I got home, went to bed. I was so tired. The voices in my head were gone. And it was like a silence, and I, I was really deeply confused, and I really didn't know who I was. Next thing I know, I heard these stones being thrown at my window, and that freaked me out, because I thought, it's the voices again. And I looked out, and uh, it was Nick and Jez. I think I eventually opened the door and that's when Nick and Jez thought it best to um, drive me back to Birmingham, to my mother's house. And it'd be interesting to ask them why, but they decided to take me to hospital instead. You sort of virtually collapsed in the back of the car, right. saying, I'm dying. Um, wow. And your eyes were rolling in the back of your head. I started hitting you. And so you were properly, you know, it was like as if you were properly passing out and dying. We thought you were dying. That's and why you we said, I've got, to you said, I've got three brains in my head. And if you died, they died too. So we wheel you through here. Yeah. And then I think it was all systems go right. Like, this was all open and you could yeah, walk straight you, through. So I was out. I was. You were sort of. You were in a wheelchair. Just like yeah, it. you were in the wheelchair and you were yeah. you know, nearly unconscious. But then you really came to again and, and really freaked out and lost it and ran, ran into a room and were raving on your knees, screaming to the sky. They then called a load of they called police. police, so there's about six officers turned up, wrestled you to the floor. And they were, wait they were waiting by the door, saying, we're not going in until the riot shields turn up. And you got slightly too near to the entrance and they just went now and pounced and just decked you and sat on you, like six of them. And then they start pumping sedatives into you and they said to us, he's had enough sedatives to knock a horse out. It's all right. Yeah. But, mate, you did it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, no. You came through it. <laughs> Fucking hell. I know. It's coming back. Some of it's coming back. I remember policemen sitting on me. Wondering what they were doing. I thought they I thought they'd caught me. I've done half the job <laughs> by getting to Camden and I'd done half the job, um, but I hadn't uh, completed the job. And now, and he had kind of been warning me about, you know, if I don't do the X, it's all going to go horribly wrong. 
and it was all going horribly wrong. So I just had to really fight to stay awake, just to kind of really thank you for what you did. I, I, I don't know what I'd done if you hadn't been here. No, I don't know what would have happened. Fuck. Yeah. Oh, fuck me. It's got real now. That's... I, yeah. I'd kind of... I'd kind of brushed all this off. I know, I know. And I'd, I'd kind of concentrated on all the funny bits. Look, this is... This is very real. Yeah. It's very scary. Fucking hell. I just... I didn't remember any of it. And no. it's something just getting here. Hmm. That you can't suddenly realise, fucking hell. This you were like... in that building there, that red brick building over there, behind, behind the trees. It was in this now derelict building that I was held under a section of the Mental Health Act for 72 hours so that mental health professionals could assess me. I can remember these roofs. I can remember looking out the window and seeing these roofs and just wanting to be outside. I just wanted to get out. I remember all these trees. I can remember all these buildings. I just wanted to get out, get outside. But I couldn't, I couldn't get out. I have completely underestimated just how much this whole process would dig up. And um, I feel like a bit of an exposed nerve at the minute because I'm, I'm, I'm realising that there's, you know, I just kind of buried a whole load of trauma for years, which was, you know, going into hospital. And now I know why I was so sore for weeks afterwards. It's because I had six coppers sitting on me for hours. 30 years later, and some things have changed. So I'm up in Birmingham, my hometown. They trialled an initiative called Street Triage. And basically, if they think there's a mental health case, this special unit will go and make sure that they are treated correctly. We've got a 17-year-old, and she's got this unusual kind of disassociative experience. So if she's got a psychotic illness, or the beginnings of the early stages of one, we want to kind of assess and, and put the right kind of treatment or care in place. So what's happened then tonight? When we found out she's basically just not engaged with us. Yeah. Uh, playing with the wrist, she's got put on the wrist. OK. We found a uh, half-written suicide note right. in the car. OK. Just something not quite right. OK. Should we go and have a chat with her? There's more people going into a mental health crisis than ever before. They cannot cope anymore and they are suicidal and they want to die or they're completely psychotic where they have no idea about what the world is around them. I've asked if you can go to Dad's. Dad won't have her. So there's nowhere else for her to go at the moment. But have a chat, see what you think. These lot have made fools out of me and I'm not accepting it. Tried to blow my house up. He had a petrol can in the back of his car. The police searched his car and they lied and said there's no petrol can. But when I searched it, there was a petrol can in there. And they're trying to say I'm mad. How can I be mad when it's real? If I reflect on what happened to me, I put me in her position right now, the triage team would have perhaps calmed me down and perhaps have settled me uh, a lot earlier than I was. There's a, a lady that I thought you might be interested in seeing called Rachel. She's a 29-year-old who's presented, um, I think, yesterday to the hospital. Dr Rowena Jones has allowed me to shadow her on one of her rounds. 
She's had quite a long history of psychiatric problems. She had an admission um, back in 2010 of a psychotic episode. Right. She's not been very well. There's possibly some drug withdrawal. Family are concerned about her mental state. Um, so I thought we'll go and have a chat and see what, how we can help. Rachel's at a severe moment of crisis, but her family have kindly let us film. Hello. This is Rachel. Rachel, do you want to say hello? Rachel, hello. can we say hello? Hello, Rachel. I'm David. Do you remember casualties? How are you? Yeah. I'm, um, I'm, I'm here doing, making a, uh, a programme because I, I myself had a psychotic episode. I think it was emotional trauma that led to using drugs in the very beginning at an adolescent age. Then I think things like postnatal depression and stimulate episodes. And when you're not diagnosed, you don't understand. So then you look for other ways to heal yourself, which increases the drug aspect. And then before you know it, it crashes. It's very, it's, you know, it's so traumatic for the family. It's really hard. Sorry to ask questions when I know you're not feeling well. I know from looking at your notes, you've had these voices and sometimes you've had some problems with your thoughts. And the devil. You've, the devil? Yeah. What do you mean by that? What makes you think that's that's something that's been done by the devil? He's been with me forever. Mm -hmm. it changes into things. It could be a person. Right. It could be darkness. <laughs> it could be anything. The devil being in her throat, she said, the devil's in my throat. And she kept, she kept doing this. Yeah. yeah. There's obviously something that's bothering yeah. her that... Yeah. Sometimes it arrives completely unannounced. You know, people suddenly develop a conviction that you know, the devil is, is in my body or something. I, I had... When I, when I was um, uh, admitted uh, 30 years ago, I, I had the belief that I had three people's brains really? in my brain. And it was, you know, completely real. It's something that comes out of the studies as well, that the power of a voice is okay. what controls. It's not necessarily the nastiness of it, it's the power that you feel it has over you at that mm. time. And that's what you are talking about in there and again now. I can really attest to the power of that delusion. Mm. Probably this is the first time in 30 years I'm beginning to put the pieces together. And I'm beginning to really understand in my head what was going on. This young man was admitted under the care of consultant psychiatrists. The patient is acutely psychotic, aggressive, inappropriate. Four days before admission, he started to behave bizarrely and said that he'd been invisible. Believe that he had merged hearts with a black boy. It's almost as if my brain was just clearing out a whole load of confusion and crap and pain, all the things that were causing me enormous stress. What was confusing me so much back then was that suddenly I was being all I could be and all I was being told I was, was a black actor. I got a job almost straight out of drama school, which was playing Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. You know, I just thought I had a job. I thought, oh, great, I've got a you know, nice job, lead role. And then when the reviews came out, I suddenly started realising they were, they were all prefaced by black actor David Harewood. Black Theatre Company, Temple Theatre Company. The black production of Roman. I, was, I thought I was just doing Roman and Juliet. No, 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 you're doing a black production of Roman and Juliet. And you're a black actor. Although I was conscious of myself as a black person, it really wasn't until I got out of drama school that the world said to me, you are black. Your aspirations your dreams, your hopes are now restricted. 
I'm starting to wonder how much my psychosis was connected to the racism I was dealing with, and if my experience is shared with other young black men. There are lots of reasons why young black men are being sectioned more. One reason is that black men come to the mental health system later than their white counterparts, and that's for fear of being hospitalised, fear of being stigmatised. They arrive at hospital at crisis point, really. Let me just... I'm, I'm going to go for my bag here. I'm going to look, show you my um, records from 30 years ago. Oh, wow. See, so look at this. I mean, this is like... This is what a doctor wrote. Lively, bit of a clown, but sly underneath. That's awful. It's awful. It's absolutely awful. Very hostile and angry, shouting and fighting, given diazepam with the help of six policemen. Gosh. Do you think that authorities consider us more dangerous? I do, and I definitely think that there's a story that exists uh, for how black men are seen in society, and that influences people's uh, perceptions. Uh, images of black men as violent, um, hypermasculinity. So I think when a black man uh, presents in crisis, sometimes people's ideas about what black men are like um, overshadow the person that's actually in front of them. So you think all those negative connotations, all those negative, all that negative language plays into the... It can play into your conception, your conception of yourself. Of self. Exactly, exactly. Mm. And the ideas of who you want to be and who you can be. Mm. And I guess that's the part marginalisation plays mm -hmm. of images of self. If everybody you see on TV is white and, uh -huh. and all the police are white, yeah. all the heroes are white, it can subtly seep yes. into your... Yes, it, that's exactly it. So I think it, sometimes it's kind of referred to as the everyday struggle, which is just lo what life is like for a young black man. Um, experiences of marginalisation, oppression, discrimination. That's and really I interesting. And I think that actually things like that, experience like that, can have a, a cumulative yeah. effect in the development of psychosis. Mm. It's good to hear that kind of what happened to me wasn't just as a result of my individual issues, problems, but that there are factors at play in people that look like me. And obviously I'm not that confused young boy, but it's, it's really painful to, 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 to look at him. It's really painful to look at him and thinking, wow, you were really lost, really lost. Seeing those kids at early intervention, I almost envied them. I would love to have had that. I would love to have had a shared experience like that, where we all sat and talked about what was happening to us. Hey, bud. Oh, how are we doing, pal? Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, are you? Good, good. I'm tired, man. Uh, I can imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah, tired, um, tired. Um, how was your week? No, nah, yeah, man, it's been, it's been good. I, I, as, as I was saying to other people, just, if it's not a bad week, for me, it's a good week. It makes sense. I know exactly nothing, what you Nothing mean. special has happened. Yeah. But because nothing bad happened, I've considered that as, like, a, a good week. Psychosis is a really isolating experience. They often feel that no one else can understand what they're going through and avoid their friends and actually coming to a group like this where everyone is going through a similar experience it really does help to normalize it my voice was it was religious it was based off good principles and doing good deeds for other people so when i explain people my psychosis i don't see it as like something negative psychosis goes to the heart of your identity people feel that they're putting themselves back together like a jigsaw puzzle. So this, the, the place like the drop-in, when they can share experiences, can help them to realise other people are going through the same thing. And if they can get through it, then so can I. It's all right. Well done. I've got this third-party voice. There's my voice, your voice, and the voice that sounds like it's 
a teacher in, a, in an overcrowded classroom and she's trying to talk but nobody's listening. Does it tell you to do things? Yeah. It did do. I had to martyr myself to save my family. Throw yourself in front of a white lorry because the white resembles this, this kind of purity thing where you have a chance that you might come back. And when you saw it, you stepped out in front of it? I didn't step out in front of it. I took a really deep breath like I did now and just went for it. Hit it. Rolled. I can remember just getting off and running off. I left that lorry. I, did I, he stop? I'm so sorry. He did. He stopped, and another car stopped, and I ran. I and I, I I'm really sorry to have done that to that person in that. But I really thought that this was the way that I had to go. Yeah. I can't believe that I did it, but I did. If I'd gone to a doctor just days before I hit that lorry. I wouldn't have gone into hospital. Yeah, I'm the same. If I'd have taken a bottle of tablets... When, when I was probably supposed to, I wouldn't have had this huge, dramatic crash that I ended up having. But I remember how much I used to fight it, how much I was in denial about things and how angry I used to get and, and refuse help. But then... When you know you need it, get it. Yeah. When you know, when you're really off balance, don't. I couldn't. Can't believe I let myself get that that bad. I don't know if you still hear the voices or see things. What do you do when you check in with myself? Remind myself that this type of thing has happened before, and it's just my third party voice. Don't have to listen to it. Certainly don't have to answer to it. It's just my third party voice. Get on with what you're doing. Keep washing up. You guys are really kind of helping me out in, in a little bit. You, know? yeah. you guys are kind of helping me out a little bit. Um, but it's because we're, we're, we're being honest with each other. That's that, that, yeah. I've nothing. When sometimes you hit a place where mm. you have to be honest yeah. about everything. Incredible girl, incredible girl. She's just astonishing how she's dealing with it. And the things that she's talking about, I recognise all of them. And she's still able to kind of be articulate and um, together, because I'm a bit of a mess at the minute, I've got to be honest with you. <sighs> I've not necessarily been honest with myself over the years, and this process has made me realise how much of myself I've probably buried. I've never felt ashamed of it. I've never felt ashamed of the breakdown, but maybe I've felt ashamed of the reasons, the reasons why I had the breakdown. I sometimes perhaps feel I'm not quite enough, or I'm not good enough, or I'm not black enough, or I'm not... You know, I think I've, there's, there's, there are times when I've had that, that issue. By finding out about my most vulnerable moment, I feel like I'm starting to own it. But there's a part that's missing. Hello? Hello, Mum. Oh, hi, kid. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Not too bad. You know, I'm, um, Even though my family were a huge part of my recovery, we've really never talked about my psychosis. Once I'd been released from, from Whittington, uh, my sister and my mum came to take me back to Birmingham and hopefully start my recovery. But something happened again which made me relapse. Hi, Mum. Oh, hi, Bob. How are you? <laughs> Where are you off to? Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Oh, OK, love. Yeah. You all right? Yeah. For the first time since it happened, Mum's agreed to talk about it with me. Oh, my goodness. It's so long ago. I'm still trying to work out the 
chronology then, Mum. So yeah. Do you you, don't forget, it happened twice. Okay. Remember, you had the first. You had the first incident when Jeremy, mm -hmm. when Jeremy yeah. called mm -hmm. and told me what was wrong, and we yeah. came and fetched you. Mm -hmm. I brought you to Birmingham, and you got better. But then you went back to London. And then something, I think you did something, you smoked something or did something, I don't know, you possibly, did something. Possibly spoke to you. Did something, I think you did it. You did something. Um, so then you came to get me. Yeah, and that's when we fetched you. Yeah, you came back here. Yeah, yeah. And the doctor said, well, you'll have to go away for a while, he said. Four weeks after being released from the Whittington Hospital in London, I ended up here, in what was then the Hollymore Hospital in Birmingham, on another locked ward. I don't remember arriving at the Hollymore, but I remember trying to get out. I remember sitting there thinking, where's my mum? I don't know anybody in here, I don't need to be in here. And I remember going to the doors and trying to push the doors open. And they were locked. I didn't enjoy leaving you behind, honest to God. Mm. You know, I remember having a prayer, and I just said to the Lord, this is whatever else is, just, Whatever is wrong, just let it be me and not David. As I walk down that, walk down, walk down here. Just let it be me, you know. Take me and not David. I remember having to take the antipsychotic medication every day. And it made me like that really slow. They were really depressing me. I would never advocate psychosis is treated with medication alone, but the medication helps to treat the symptoms, help people feel better, help them to become more robust, and also minimises the, the risk of a further episode of psychosis, particularly in that first 12 months. Around 15% of people never have another episode of psychosis and never need to use medication again. But some people need medication longer term to prevent multiple episodes of psychosis. Hello, David. <laughs> Hello, how nice are you? Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, nice to see yeah, you. Yeah, nice to see you. Shall I give you the grand tour? It's only I a one-bedroom flat. I mean, it's not used to it. It's not... The lobby. The lobby. <laughs> um, oh, that was my very first ship in my 20s. That's me. <laughs> employee of the month. You got employee cheesy, of the month? Cheesy cheese balls, yeah. I used to get employee of the month. Um, yeah, I was in Langkawi in Malaysia. Thailand. You've travelled a hell of a yeah. lot. I did seven world cruises before the age of 30. Not bragging, but that's... <laughs> Do you miss those days? Thailand. I miss the travelling days. You would, would I you miss the travelling. Would you go back to it? I would go back to it, but with a very different approach. A lot of these pictures where I'm happy and gleaming and it all looks good. The night before, I would have been up till 3 o'clock in the morning drinking smoking and just being very self-destructive. Mm. But my motto was, as long as I get to breakfast, you know, as long as I get to breakfast, I'm all right. <laughs> I'm OK, as long as I make it to breakfast. Mm. Wow. These are my tablets. These are the other tablets that sometimes I have to take. I take three tablets a day. I have diazepam and zopiclone as a patient request when needed. And um, I have a depot injection once a month. The injection is the antipsychotic. It's called paripelidone. Some of the side effects of my injection makes me lactate, um, which is weird, because <laughs> I'm, I'm not pregnant. Um, that's, that can be a bit invasive, but the main side effects are quite positive. I'm not hallucinating. I'm not hearing as much as what I was hearing before. Not anywhere near what I was hearing or seeing before. Mm -hmm. So those are positive side effects. What happens if you don't take them? Can you sense it kind of coming on? 
the antipsychotic when I stopped taking the quetiapine, I would I I would be quite irrational and quite aggressive. Sometimes I'd hallucinate before wow. bedtime. Yeah. Wow. Girl. I mean, how oh, you inspire me actually. Really? Yeah. Despite the condition and the tablets and all of the stuff that you're having to deal with, you, you, you used to look me in the eye and smile and make me laugh and, <laughs> you, you know, you've still got that. And I think that's a real testament to you, because you don't have to let it defeat you. I don't have to let it defeat me. And I don't have to wear a sign above my head to say I've got a mental illness or I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, leave me alone. Mm. But, um, yeah, I've, I, I have to, I have to accept what's going on. I'm a lot calmer, I'm a lot rational. You seem very calm today. Yeah, yeah. Try not to let my past haunt me too much. I think I've been extremely lucky that my confusion, my delusion, was almost like a fever. That's not true for everybody. Some people, their mental health is a real battle just to get through the day. It's been really tough to do this, but at the same time, I've learned a hell of a lot. One of the things that was told to me was that people in psychiatric hospitals get less get well cards than any other form of illness. Because there's no language to talk about it. People don't want to tell people that they've had a psychiatric problem. People are ashamed of their psychiatric problems. But what's hopeful is that there's a way back and there's a... Not for everyone, but there's a way back. Over to the right there, have you remembered? That top flat, that was my flat. This one here? Yeah, that top one there. After 15 days at the Hollymore Hospital, Mum brought me back home. My medication was slowly reduced. When they said you could come home, I just, just, just we just got the bus and we came home. And that was it. The but, old David came back. Well, I don't think it was the old David. I think it was the new David. Oh well. Oh no. Yeah, it could be right. Yeah. You've come a long way, but yeah. yeah. No, look, you know, I mean, I'm really, but I say one of the things I'm realised throughout all of this yeah. is how much I relied on Nick and Jess. But I mean, you've been a real soldier. Oh, a I real did soldier. try. I did try. <laughs> try? You did it? <laughs> I did try. You know, it was in my day. <laughs> Thanks, Mum. <laughs> okay. Don't mention it. It'll cost you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Let's get some food. Huh? Let's get some food. Yeah, get I suppose so, yeah. If you want to find out more about psychosis and understand the misconceptions around it, go to the webpage on the screen and follow the links to the Open University.